seeing the healing ministry. So we must place our trust in the call to go and serve. The Lord, prepare us to say, to truly be disciples you would have us Let God's praise be heard in the midst of the congregation. Shout praise to the Lord of hosts. Let God's praise be proclaimed wherever we are. May we praise God in all that we do and say, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we are called to go to mission and into the mission field around us. And Father, we thank you for this congregation as we gather together to praise you and to lift your name on high. As we gather this morning, may we remember the call you have placed on all of our lives, that we are all disciples, and that we are all sent in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. This morning, our next praise time, we're going to sing of the greatness of God. We're going to sing of good, to the goodness of Him by singing our hallelujahs. And we're also going to answer His call when He knocks on the door. So would you please stand up as we continue our worship this morning?
spirit which indwells within each one of us. We give you praise and thanks this morning for the beautiful summer day that we have. We thank you for all days, for every day is new in you. And we thank you, Lord God, for these gifts. We thank you for our children that are going to camp, and we thank you that they will have a wonderful time and be blessed in that. And we thank you, Father, that we can give back to you all that we have, Lord God. Everything we own comes from you, and we are so very blessed. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We now come to our monthly communion service, and we thank you that it is a time that we gather together to share the table of the Lord, and we are grateful that we have this community in which we can share the table that we can share it with you as Jesus shared it with his disciples. And as we come this morning, we thank you that we can be blessed in saying the Lord's Prayer together. A beautiful prayer. And so let us come together, speaking as one voice, saying and praying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come,
that we might be one, that we might be a community, that we might be children of the most holy God. As we break this bread as a symbol of his body, which was broken for us, we remember the cross. We remember the sacrifice. We remember his love for each one of us. Let us give thanks for the bread. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. For it is through your death and resurrection we have been put right with God our Father. As we partake of this bread, the symbol of your body broken on the cross, we acknowledge the enormous price that you paid for our sinful ways, for our words and actions that so often show that we do not love you as we ought, nor our neighbors love do we love as we love ourselves. Help us to never forget that by your sacrifice, our sins have been redeemed. Show us how to live each day with gratitude and a renewed desire to lead others to know you and your amazing mercy and grace. Thank you for the forgiveness and peace that only you can give. Amen. Let us take our bread. Let us eat, remembering Jesus Christ's love to each one of us and our redemption. Jesus also took the cup. And as we remember the blood that was shed on the cross, we acknowledge that we have been washed in that blood and made clean as snow because of the forgiveness of our sins. We all fall short of the glory of God. There is not one of us that is perfect, only him. But because of his sacrifice, that he willingly gave his life for you and for me, we can say that we are forgiven, and we thank you. Let us give thanks to him for our forgiveness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together to celebrate communion, to honor the last supper you shared with your disciples. This cup is symbolic of the blood shed for us. We offer it up to you with humble hearts, mindful of what it costs you. We drink it to honor and praise you, showing our love for you. May we go forth proclaiming your name, bearing witness to the life you gave for our sins. Fill us now with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might continue to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us take our drink. remembering the cross of Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. Thank you. 
<laughs> it was during summer break, so no. Do you think if it was during school year, would they have been really happy to see you? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Now, what if they didn't want to see you? What if they said, no, I don't want to be your friend anymore? That's okay. They wouldn't miss you? Really? Why? Oh, well, because it didn't want to be. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's why they, yeah. Okay. So that's the truth. That's the truth. Now, I'm going to tell the big people a story. Um, Jesus went away from his hometown, and when he came back, he think they threw a great big celebration for him? No? Yeah? Why, why do you think yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why do you think no?
Judah in the south and Israel in the north were now under one leader, King David. David did not immediately, though, accept their invitation. In fact, it took three appeals before he agreed. The first was that they were his bone and flesh. That was stretching it a little bit as David was from Bethlehem of Judah. But both were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so in that sense it was true. On that basis, why should they be divided? Second, they appealed to his leadership and bravery. He was the one who had led them in battle, even while Saul was king. But still, they came to him with a third appeal. This one, the most powerful. Yahweh, God, said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. This last appeal, David could not ignore. Shepherds provide leadership and protection of the flock. Often in the Old Testament, God is referred to as shepherd. They are tender leaders, caring for their flock. And David was a good shepherd. And from his lineage would come the greatest good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And though David did not know it at this time, this was the factor upon which David accepted and made a covenant with them in Hebron. What is interesting here, and that which we would not normally recognize just by reading this, is that usually a covenant made between two unequal parties is the fact that the most powerful one here, it would be David, would dictate the terms of the weaker and the covenant. The covenant, however, is made before Yahweh, and David becomes king over Judah. And in fact, it was the weaker who made the terms of the covenant, which became a binding relationship. Now, David could have refused. He could have remained connected only to Judah and not made the whole land a community under his rule. He did not do that, however. He reigned over Judah for seven years and six months, and all Judah and Israel for 33 years, a total of 40 years in completion. And David became stronger and stronger because it says the Lord was with him. And though the people in Jesus' hometown did not see it, God was with Jesus as well. But Jesus is God. He has been successful in other communities like Korea, and we would expect that he would receive the same from his hometown folk. But it was not to be. But here at home, they want to weaken him with their cynicism. The people are astonished at his teaching, for sure, but not here at home, not now. They are negative in their thoughts as they process his words. It's a continuation of the disciples' question from the boat two weeks ago. Who is this man? The crowds in Jesus' hometown know him. They, they know his brothers and his sisters and his mother. They've watched him grow up, and they have watched him leave his mother to become this itinerant preacher, teacher that could be leading all of these people into harm. He should have just stayed here as a stonemason or a carpenter. Who does he think he is? Well, Jesus was surprised at this attitude, offended even, but he's not surprised enough to forfeit who he is. Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, he says to the crowds. There is a price to receiving this type of honor, though. If one is announced as excelling in one or more areas, others are considered losers. I was at my grandson's grade eight graduation a couple of weeks ago. It came to the time when the teachers would give out medals for the excellence in mathematics and geography and history and, you know, all of that. <coughs> One young girl took two medals. 
a young man took my medal, and there was one other young man that took all the rest of the medals. I'm sure that he was brilliant. There were at least eight medals given to this young man. I watched my grandsons as each were handed out to this young man. I watched the mothers too, but mostly my grandson. He was excited for this award winner. He would, uh, the, the young man had to walk around him every time he received one to sit down, and my grandson would high five him and smile and clap enthusiastically, and you know, all of that stuff, give him words of encouragement as he ran around the corner and around and around and around. And I thought, wow, isn't that something? He could have been jealous. Uh, maybe some of them were. But he wasn't. It was amazing because this young man was honored in this place, in his school, among his friends. You know, it was beautiful to see. He was enthusiastically welcomed by everyone in that group and deserved the honor that was given him. Now, this is not so with Jesus. He is amazed at the home folks lack of faith, and this challenged Jesus' ability to perform miracles of healing in his community. Instead, what those people did was isolate themselves from the power that he had and he would willingly use in their community to bring his message of hope and love and wholeness. This can happen in any community. We know that, don't we? Divisions caused by Jealousy, bitterness, anger, rejection, all can happen at the drop of a dime. And isolation begins to take shape in a community. One side pits itself against the other and a community breaks apart. Jesus kept on, though, and moving from there, he commissioned the twelve, not giving up, but sending them out so that they could go the first time all alone by themselves. They were preparing for their own mission, and the rejection that he received was preparation for them. Who of us has also not felt that rejection? People isolate themselves from the truth of Jesus Christ all around us. Rejection from people we try to witness to is nothing new. Family, friends, and associates all have rejected us and our message of Jesus Christ. But note where Jesus sent the twelve, where he first made them go. First into homes. You see, the synagogues have been growing places of mass rejections by the leaders and the teachers who were grounded in their traditions and their authority. In these places, it was hard for Jesus' message to have influence. But in homes, it was different, as they were more open when these disciples had to depend upon them for their sustenance. It's the, the motive of sitting down to dinner and sharing a story, you know? When people hear you in these settings, um, it's different because their hearts are more in tune with what you have to say. And the vulnerability of these twelve that they faced when they went out was also a factor in their reception because Jesus sent them with nothing. They had to depend on each home and upon God alone. Second, they took with them anointing oil. They did preach repentance, but the oil set them apart as they anointed the sick. They were also set apart for the taking of their essentials. They could take no bread, no bag, no money, and only a single tunic. They were to proceed, trusting in the community which they encountered, and for the people to provide hospitality. And above all this, for God to provide for their needs. Jesus' final words to them were for them to shake off the dust from their sandals, if they were not hurt. In this way, the disciples 
disciples declare an unreceptive community as one that wishes to remain isolated from Jesus Christ. There are people who still refuse to hear us as we speak Jesus. And maybe we too will have to shake our sandals off and the dust from our feet with some. But this also is freeing as it leads us into other places where God calls us, where we can speak God's word into more fertile places. We are called to be faithful in our proclamation of Jesus Christ, to build community in places that are isolated. We are called to faithfulness, not success. You see, it is God who will prepare the way, and it is God who will give the increase. People then must make a choice when we come to them, and they must choose. Will it be for Jesus or not? Will it be for community or for isolation? We pray that they will choose community.
want to enter our endeavors with full support and affirmation. We are afraid to begin a task, even if our families, our friends, and our hometown people belittle it. They're not so us. So rather than face degradation, we back down. Forgive our lack of faith and vision. Empower us to be in service to you, even when we do not feel the support of our families. Let us trust in your power and presence with us. Heal us, Lord. Guide our lives and our journeys all our days. And then we will hear you say, do not be afraid of the derision of others. Place your trust in my call and guidance. Know that I, the Lord, are with you always, even which is hurting and scared, needs our prayers and our service. We think of Lois, Terry and Teresa, Terry R, Sally, Jessica, and others that are close to us. Father, be with them, and may they know your love and our love for them. We trust in you, Lord, to point us in the direction of service to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
comes with you to give you words of hope, comfort, and peace. May God's love flow through you to all those whom you meet. Amen.